Hi there, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. James Lehman, um, coming to you live from San Antonio, Texas, uh, in our uh, ambulatory surgical center. Behind me is my staff getting the patient prepared, and we're going to be demonstrating DMEX surgery today. Um, we have two cases. Uh, they're just DMEX, no DMEX and cataract. That was a little bit of miscommunication on the uh, title, but two DMEX surgeries. So before we get started, I'm gonna go through a few slides and give you a bit of an introduction, okay? Okay, so you guys can see the uh, desktop now. Is that good? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, so we got a live DMEX surgery. Um, a little bit of an introduction. My name is uh, Dr. James Lehman. I'm in private practice in San Antonio, Texas. And, uh, I'm an associate instructor at the UT Health Science Center here. I do cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery, and uh, about 70% of my cases are, are DMAX. I've had the good fortune to work with uh, Orbis and SightLife many times over the last 15 years, and um, I'm going to be a, uh, I was on the plane actually as a staff ophthalmologist for a year between 2005 and 2006. Um, so I guess before we get started, a lot of you guys are watching this and kind of interested in getting involved with DMAC surgery. So the question is, are, are you ready to start DMAC? Well, I think you can do it. Uh, there's a few things you have to do first. First, you have to have some experience doing penetrating keratoplasty. I would say at least 25. And then also need some experience doing DSEC surgery so you understand how to uh, control air in the anterior chamber, make incisions, etc. cetera. Um, the best way to practice is in the wet lab, like with everything. And you can practice donor preparation, pr practice donor loading, and, and the graft manipulation, all of those steps in the wet lab. So all of that is critical before you uh, do your first cases, and it's better to do it with somebody who has some experience and they can mentor you. So uh, we're going to go through a few of the slides here, and then I'm going to do the first surgery. And then during the 10 to 15 minute uh, break in between the cases, as they turn the room over, we'll go over uh, some, uh, some of the steps of surgery again. So... Um, Donor selection, um, here in the US when we request tissue, what we receive is a t t tissue detail form like this where it goes over the um, parameters of, uh, of, of the donor. Um, and so in DSEC and PK, what we like is uh, somebody from young, age young in their, in their maybe five to 10 years old range to 65. We like the day since death to be about 12. The death to preservation time uh, about 10 hours or with refrigeration about 20 about 2,500 cell counts per square millimeter and a, a central clear zone if it's a PK. We also like to look at the specular microscopy image down here and confirm that the cells look uniform and small. But in uh, DMEC, it's a little bit different. Um, older is better in DMEC patients because uh, the endothelium goes to the outside when it's been removed from, uh, it scrolls to the outside and the, it makes tighter scrolls the younger the patient. So about 45 is my lowest threshold for a DMEC donor up to about 65. Uh, Pseudofakes aren't good donors because sometimes they have uh, phaco incisions and corneal incisions that extend into the area that you're trying to prep. Also, there's a little bit of debate about whether diabetics make good donors. Sometimes they have a tendency to tear during the preparation process. And so um, how donor preparation has evolved in the U.S. Uh, at first, we were doing it in the operating room prior to the surgery. This was about 10 years ago. And uh, this, this works, and it's done in most countries, actually. But in the U.S., uh, there's some risk involved in the sense that the corneas are quite expensive, and if you damage them during preparation, uh, first of all, you have to cancel the case, and secondly, uh, the surgery center has to take the, uh, or the hospital has to take the hit for the tissue. So it's evolved now like DSEC did, where the eye bank prepares the DMAC tissue, and you can see this is from Corneagen, which is the cousin to Side Life, and they, pro they provide my tissue, and they provide it in a glass vial, already loaded in a glass cannula, stained, and marked if you wanted it. Alrighty, so um, we're going to talk now. Uh, we're going to go now to a live screen of me, and we're going to um, show you a little bit about the tissue for this case, and then we're going to get started. So when I receive the tissue, it comes in a box like this, okay? And here's the vial, and you can see the tissue right there on the corner. So we like to kind of invert it for a while like this and let it kind of travel down. And then this is the form that I receive on the patient, okay, like I talked about. Now what's nice is after the cut, the eye bank then takes another photo and shows us that the cells still look good. It does another count to help show that there was a, it was an atraumatic preparation. Now I do not get the S stamp on my tissue 
because when I learned to do DMEC years ago, uh, the S-Stamp wasn't really around. So I learned to use what's called a portable slit lamp. It's a small microscope like this to determine the orientation. So I just want to go over this before we start the surgery. The DMEC always scrolls with the endothelium to the outside like this, okay? Always to the outside, never the other way. And so we want to get it in a position in the eye where it's scrolled like this. Now we have to determine, is it like this? which is what we want with the endothelium down, or is it like this, which would be bad. You don't want to put an air bubble under this and smush the endothelium across the, uh, the posterior stroma. So once we get it in the eye, you're going to see me turn out the lights and then use this little microscope and move a slit beam, okay? And what we want to see on the slit beam are two rolls, two rolls like this, okay? We want to see rolls like this, not a big broad roll like that. That would tell me it's upside down. So, um, all right, let me just check on the team. Everybody good? Okay, everybody's good. So we're gonna get started here. Um, so we're gonna keep you here on the webcam and then once I get started, we'll switch to the microscope camera, okay? And Ashley, I'm putting the... Okay. Okay, we're doing a timeout. That's uh, Miss Miss right eye Hughes dystrophy. Okay, very good. DMEC. Okay. All righty. So, this patient is 75 year old female uh, with a history of Fuchs dystrophy, and uh, she's had cataract surgery, which is uh, why we're just going to do DMEC today. All right. Now we're switching to the OR camera. Putting a new glove on, guys. There we go. And uh, we're going to get the eye under the camera here and nice and centered. And you guys will be telling me, Tom, you can tell me. And folks, if I get out of center, you'd let me know and I'll, and I'll recenter. Miss Turner, you doing okay there, ma'am? Okay, patient's doing well. How's that look, guys? Pretty good? Okay. All right, so. Um, we get started, guys. You can get the room lights. So I like to start the surgery first by uh, putting in some traction sutures. So this is a little unusual. You probably have watched DMEC videos and not seen this. But it allows us to rotate the eye if needed, which isn't always necessary, but can be critical when you have a difficult case and you're trying to uh, center that, that DMEC lenticule. So now I'm cutting the suture, and then I'm going to use some 0.12s and just tie it and put it off to the side. Um, so here we are right here, tying that into a little knot and then putting that off to the side. This is a 4-0 silk suture on a tapered needle. You can see the needle's tapered. It's not a cutting needle. A cutting needle is kind of dangerous in this scenario because you can go too deep. And we want to take an episcleral bite about three millimeters posterior to the inferior and superior limbia of the cornea. So there we go there. And this is just enough to be able to control the eye and rotate. And so in between the surgeries, I'll show you some videos of other cases in which you can uh, kind of see why, it's, why this is useful. There's kind of different ways to do DMEX. So what I'm gonna demonstrate today is, is based on what Frank Price taught us years ago. I can't take credit for the technique. Um, and it can be helpful to have these traction sutures. The next step is to mark the central eight millimeters of the cornea. When I order a cornea from Corneagen, I specify what diameter I want it, and that depends on how uh, the diameter of the cornea shapes uh, comes out. And so this patient had a normal 12 millimeter cornea. In a lot of places, the corneas are smaller. I visited India and China and Peru, and sometimes 7.5 would be a better match for your DMEC. Um, so now I'm just using a marking pin, and I'm marking the area that we're going to center the DMEC graft. And then I'll just mention one other thing here is that you can see a little inferior iridotomy. That was done with a YAG laser prior to surgery and that's going to be helpful for the air bubble management. And so you can do that interest, uh, during the surgery with a vitrector, um, but it's easier in my opinion and at least more economical in the U.S. to do it preoperatively. And so I'm just fixating the globe here with 0.12s and I'm going to enter the anterior chamber at 45 degrees from where my main incision will be. And do the same over here. 
And I don't want these tunnels very long because if they extend into that area that I've outlined, it can interfere with uh, the bubble placement later in the surgery. Uh, put some BSS on the cornea, DD. And then this is a cohesive viscoelastic. And I like to remove decimase under viscoelastic. And I suggest for your first cases, you do that as well. You can do it under air. It's just can be difficult and tiresome to maintain the, to maintain the um, uh, chamber depth. So now I'm going to make my main wound. Uh, with, the, with the cornea gen cannula, we can enter the eye with a 2.4 incision. This is a 2.65. Uh, I'm going to make it not quite as big as I can with that. So I made it about 2.5 there. And then this is a reverse Sinsky hook. You can see any Sinsky hook can be made reverse if you just uh, bend it with some needle drivers. And then what I'm going to do now, I'm just demonstrating it, is I'm going to score Decimay's membrane and remove it. So I like to start here and I'm following my marks. And I'm applying enough pressure, you can see, to kind of gently whiten the cornea but not so much that it's a, it's a jerky movement. If you push too hard, you go like that and you can't move it. So you just want to kind of glide. And I like to go around two times and kind of ensure that I have a nice area that's been scored. And then I go across the anterior chamber and then you can see the edge that I'll get here. You can see that edge. And I'm going to peel the cornea and just nice gentle motions, keeping an eye on the lateral aspects of the removal to make sure that the whole guy comes out in one uh, big piece. And when I remove this, you'll see how the view to the, to the iris improves tremendously. The guttata, not just the edema, can affect the vision. And that's part of the reason why you remove the patient's endothelium uh, and why even just a few central guttata can, can be problematic. Um, so now we're removing it and comes out in one nice big piece here. And if, uh, if you wanted to, what you can do is kind of, it broke in half there, you can put it out on the cornea and kind of unfold it. But I know I got the whole thing there, so I'm gonna give it to the assistant here. It's all, there we go, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to remove that viscoelastic, and the way we do that is just with the INA handpiece from the FACO. Okay. A lot of it kind of slid out through the main wound. And now while I'm doing this, I'm looking around for any tags that may still be there because they would be problematic in getting the new graft to adhere. But there's no tags. So I remove that. And then we're now going to prep, we're now going to get the donor uh, ready. So you get the room lights for me, guys. Now, I switch to a back table here, which is what I'm doing while you see the eye over there. And it's on this back table that will kind of prep the donor. It's already in the tube. We just have to rinse out the, the current solution and uh, put in some, uh, replace it with BSS. So I'm turning the light down a little bit because it can get very bright with that reflection. All right. And uh, let's see, come right here, Ashley. All right, and just with a, you can't see, I'm just removing the plastic sled from the, the bottle, and now I'm putting it down right here. So I'm going to zoom out for you guys so you can see this. Okay, so now we're zooming out, and I just placed in a big Petri dish. I placed, I placed that, this is, the, this is the way it comes from the eye bank. So there's a glass tube here. There's the DMAC right there, all scrolled up in blue already. There's a cap on this end. And I'll brighten it up a little bit. There's a there's a there's a cap here, and a cap there. And that pinkish hue is the uh, optisol. And so we're going to rinse. I'm going to remove first. I'm going to take out the uh, the glass. Now I remove that sled that it lived in, and now it's just a glass tube there. You guys can see okay, or is it too much glare? All right. I see. I know what I can do. There, oh, sorry. That's better. Maybe too dark. It was before better. Okay, so now what we want to do is kind of, it's already ready there. It's in the neck of the device. There's not much optisol in there. So I'm going to go ahead and load it. Now, how do I load it? Uh, you use a uh, 3cc syringe. That's what this is right here. 
and then it just attaches nicely to the back end of this. And then I can flush a little bit more of the Optisol out without, uh, so now I'm just making sure there's no bubble there. Now I'm gonna attach it via lure lock to the 3cc syringe. Now I'm gonna lift it up, and kind of concentrate here. And I'm gonna put just some gentle flushing here. You can see some stuff coming out, that's the Optisol. So it's all ready to go, it's right there in the neck. Maybe go a little more, but it's kind of right to hit that peg. We don't want to hit the peg, so we're good to go. I also make sure that it's nice and attached right there. And then I'm handing it over to our little scrub tech desk right there. And now I'm going to turn my attention back to the patient. And just look at the anterior chamber here and kind of get zoomed in again. Lights off, please. All right, now, some BSS on a cannula, please. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, fill the AC a little bit. You can see it's a little flat. Okay. And there's some uh, heme kind of floating around, so I wanna get some of that out. We don't want any fibrin or heme in the AC, nice and clear now. Okay, I'll take the cornea. And then again, here's my little device. I'm gonna hold the lure lock. I mean, I'm gonna hold the tube and I'm gonna remove that little peg in the front. So now you can see the injector, you can see it's beveled. I like to go bevel in. And that's, that's good. Now it's perpendicular, that's what we want so that it doesn't come out. And now I'm gonna place one suture, normally a, a 10 right through the main wound before I do any manipulation of the donor. It's very delicate at this point because if that little guy can still slip out easily, especially if there's any significant uh, fluid in the anterior chamber that escapes when you place the suture. Okay, so I'm gonna just uh, make sure I got enough tail here. I'm gonna cut this and then I'll tie it. Okay, so these are just straight tires. Put a little BSS on the cornea for me. Okay. And of course, a 311 knot like we normally do. Moderately tight. Not too tight because the, the eye is very sh flat right now. And then that's a 311 knot. I'll cut that and bury it. Okay, okay and now uh, begins the positioning and then confirmation of your orientation. So you know, this is a big 10 cc syringe with BSS and what we have to do now is we have to unroll the graft and then we have to unfold it, okay? So first we have to unroll it and verify its orientation. So how do we do this? Well, you manipulate the depth of the chamber and you use bursts of fluid to get the little guy to unroll. So it looks pretty scrolly right now. Scrolly is just like a word for it being tight. Now you can see it's opening a little bit, but when we get it open, we have to shallow the chamber. So I'm using bursts of fluid, hit on the iris, and then I'm gonna shallow the chamber through the main wound. So now it's a, little bit, it's a little bit off center right there, but it's in the correct orientation, I believe. So if I flatten the chamber now, and then I tap on this little guy, I can get it to unfold. Okay, now the question is what the orientation is. I'm gonna get it, I wanna get it to unroll a little more but it's kind of not agreeing. It's being a little awkward and wants to stay tightly scrolled. So I'm gonna shallow the chamber a little more. And then I'm gonna tap on it perpendicular, get it to unroll a little bit and see if I can determine the orientation. Okay, let's see. So I'm gonna turn out the lights here and just use my little flashlight and I can tell it's upside down. So now I have to evert it, so I have to flip it. So how do you flip it? I shoot water underneath it and it comes around the angle and makes it, makes it flip in the right direction. So we got it to flip, now it's in the correct orientation, but it's all scrolled up again. So you gotta be real careful because every time you let fluid out, it's gonna wanna come to wherever you let it out. So I'm gonna expand it here and I'm gonna take some fluid out of the AC
So it's being real scrolly. Okay, I think we got it in a good orientation perhaps, but I have to let some fluid out. Let's see. If I can get this fold out. No, it's folded almost in half. That makes it very difficult to un unscroll, un unroll. So gotta kind of get it again. Gotta be patient. That's what we like. We like that trifold hat orientation. So let's shallow the AC, kind of tap on it a little bit, and then we're going to see if we can determine the orientation again. And still, unfortunately, in reverse. So when I flip it again, this would be where we would want, like this, but we need it in the right orientation. So. There we got it flipped. Now I'm gonna inject some fluid into it and get it to, the chamber gets real deep and then it can just scroll up real easy. Try to inject some fluid into the scroll. Still too scrolled up. Okay, that's what we like to see, like that. But it's, uh, try to move it to the center. Let's see the orientation. Still upside down, huh? All right, guys, not wanting to cooperate. There we go. So I know it's in the right, I know it's in the right orientation now. I just flipped it and let's try to get it to unscroll a little. And confirm the orientation here. All right, so. Nope, upside down. <laughs> Always on live surgery. That's what you, all right, now this is in the correct orientation I can see, but I'm gonna confirm by Putting that, and you can see a single roll right there. That's one roll, that's two. Now, the thing is, it's a little too scrolled up, so I need to flatten the AC and then just, uh, I wanna get this, I want this to come here a little bit. So I'm gonna tap like that, get it a little unfolded more. Okay, now to get my little, now what I wanna do is put a small air bubble underneath it. And so for that, I use a 30 gauge needle like this. And I'm gonna uh, try to edge it underneath here and then give just a little bit of air. And this is gonna help me to be able to, to unfold it, not to unroll it, we've unrolled it. So I put a little bubble under it. And now we're gonna fill the AC with fluid. And now, we have the graft and I'm trying to knock all that. Now, here it's completely unfolded, but here there's a fold. So this is where the sutures come in handy because I can use that air bubble to help me un un unfold it, okay? And so the way we do this is we rotate the eye so the bubble is going uphill and I create some space and then I'm able to unroll it. Now I have to center this guy into these little marks. So I rotate the eye this way and then I'm doing some golf swings or cricket swings, whatever you like to say. Depends on the part of your world. And you always want this bubble as much in the middle so of that so that it doesn't slip out from underneath it. And so now it looks like we got it pretty well centered. It's in those marks like that. Okay, and now we can put a full air bubble in. And then, uh, and then I'm gonna leave the eye firm for about 45 minutes. And then we take enough air to clear the peripheral iridotomy. But right now what I'm doing is I'm going underneath the graft and I'm going to try to join this bubble with what I had done before. There we go. All right. So here's the outline. I know it's all good. And now I need to fill it a little more with air because if I touch the eye, you can see it's still kind of soft. So this is what I do. It's this is kind of a trick where you put just the tip of the cannula into your para and you do a small burst. 
And then we check the pressure. I'll check it with my finger. That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. So we're pretty much done. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut these traction sutures. And uh, then the patient goes to the post-op area for a while. And then I'll check her again in about 45 minutes. So thank you very much. All right. So, <laughs> so Tom, if you'll switch to the switch to the switch to the to the to the main screen. So FaceTime HD. Okay, everybody. So we're all done. Taking off my gloves now. And now the staff they're going to turn over the room for about 10-15 minutes here, and then I'll be able to go over some slides with you, and I'll answer any questions that you have. I see there's one in the Q and A area there. And then we'll do the second case. All right. Um, so one question. Uh, Dr. Sharma from, uh, sent a, message, a question saying, can staining be tried to remove decimates? All right, so in a case of Fuchs corneal dystrophy, um, the decimates won't stain if you put in vision blue. It won't stain a healthy endothelium or one that hasn't been injured with trauma. If it's pseudophagic bullous keratopathy and there's trauma to it from oil droplets or surgery or whatever, yes, staining can be helpful. It's a retrocorneal membrane, yes, it can be stained. But in a normal eye that's only had cataract surgery or not had any surgery, the blue doesn't really help you to extract the, the membrane, okay? So it's not really necessary. All right, so now I'm going to switch back to uh, my slides, and I'm going to go over a few, uh, a few uh, other tips involved in preoperative evaluation, the instruments, and to go over the steps of surgery there again, okay? So um, I'm going to share my uh, keynote. All right, so here we, back, here we are again here. And now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, preoperative evaluation. So like, how do you pick a patient for DMEX surgery, basically? Uh, the preoperative considerations or do I do a DSEC or do I do a DMEC? What type of anesthesia do I use? And other things that are important are how well can the patient cooperate and are they able to lie face up after surgery? So how to decide between DMEC and DSEC? Um, you can see this pain scale here, okay? That's for the surgeon, not for the patient, because if you choose a hard case, you're going to be in a lot of pain. So you want to pick straightforward cases for DMEC, especially your first ones. So the, the things that you have to determine are, uh, there are four of them, okay? Number one is the complexity of the anterior chamber. Are there peripheral anterior synechiae? Is the chamber shallow? Is there a valve in the eye? Have they had a history of angle closure? Is the eye small? Is there vitreous prolapse, fibrin, ACIOL? Is the iris intact? All of these things, okay? If there's answer to any of those is yes, you probably want to do DMAC at first. Although the only true contraindication for DMAC, in my opinion, is an ACIOL and being aphakic. Um, also, the corneal clarity. You have to determine how good the view for the surgeon is. Is there scarring, edema, haze? Um, if so, if it's just edema and haze, what you can do is uh, bring the patient in a few days before surgery and do a superficial keratectomy to see how well the view uh, is improved. Also, you have to be able to manage the bubble. So if there's iris defects or the eye's hypotenuse, it may be difficult to maintain that bubble fill that you need. Iris defects make DMEC very, very difficult. And then there's the lens status. Do you combine it with FACO or do you do them separately? Uh, I like to do them combined when the patient needs cataract surgery, but it's perfectly reasonable to do them sequentially. Um, so in summary, to, to plan for DMEC, you need to uh, talk about anesthesia. I like peribulbar anesthesia in these cases. I like to make sure the patient doesn't have any neck or back problems that would preclude their ability to lie flat. Uh, also, they can't be real skittish and squeezing because sometimes you have to put a bubble in the eye at the, in post-op, uh, excuse me, in the, in, the, uh, in the clinic after surgery if there's a detachment and you want them to be able to, able, be able to go through that. Who are the easiest patients? Fuchs dystrophy patients. And like I said, avoid complex anterior segments at first. And if you can do the iridotomy before, go ahead and do it. But I've done DMEC in, uh, in India and Peru, for example, and on those patients, a lot of times, the view isn't good enough to do the peripheral iridotomy, and it has to be done in surgery. All right, so what instruments did I just use? What instruments do you need to do DMEC? Well, basically a cataract set. You need that reverse Sinsky, and you need a good 1cc syringe and a 30-gauge needle. Um, you can use a blunt tree fine or a, or a marker to mark the cornea, and I like to use a cohesive viscoelastic like Helon. You do not want an, uh, 
a um, dispersive viscoelastic because you won't be able to get it all out. Uh, here's that critical instrument I talked about. Um, or you can use the S stamp. That's reasonable too. Um, again, here's a little talking about the confirmation. The shape that we want is this one where you see two little scrolls, not this upside down one. So there's this thing called a tricorn hat and we want it in this configuration. Um, for donor injection, all you need is a back table and a petri dish filled with BSS. The tripan blue could be used if you have to stain it more, but uh, you can tell that was stained well enough uh, for the surgery. And then uh, to prepare the eye to receive the new tissue, like I said, you do the traction sutures, you mark the cornea. I like to use this 4-0 silk on a tapered needle. And then the instruments that I'm using are just a normal keratome. You can do it as small as 2.4 millimeters. Uh, and you need that 15 degree blade to do the paras. I like a 15 degree blade more than the MVR because you can control the size a little better and the depth of the tunnel. Um, I also use the, a FACO pack and use the irrigation aspiration on the FACO pack, but you could use a Simco if you needed to remove the viscoelastic. Um, so here we go, walk, we're walking through some steps of surgery. This is those, those uh, traction sutures that I just did. Uh, again, about three millimeters posterior to the limbus. And, uh, you know, you just fixate the globe either by holding the conge or episclera, and that's where you want to kind of make the bite. So that's the traction sutures. And then marking the cornea, pretty self-evident. And then we'll look at the incisions here. You want that tunnel to be just shy of the, where you have it marked for the graft, because if you go inside, if the tunnel extends to here, for example, when you inject air, you're going to inject it in the interface between the DMEC and the posterior stroma. You notice I did three incisions here. So, um... This is a case of a combined FACO DMEC. Sometimes I use an, an artificial anterior chamber when I used to um, use an IOL injector for the, for the uh, DMEC, but nowadays it's not necessary when you can use the glass cannula. All right, and then removal. Let me go back there, sorry about that. All right, so in removal, what we like to see is you want that nice edge and you wanna have scored twice and then grab from outside your dots, making sure you're not getting tears and uh, remnants over in the sides. And uh, just gentle scratching movements. It's nothing real forceful. You notice you're not seeing white. If you, if you push too hard, you're going to leave gashes in the posterior stroma, and it's going to be difficult to get the DMEC to stick because it's going to be an uneven, an uneven surface. So this was a combined case. You can see the red reflex is very good through that artificial lens now. I had just done the cataract part. So um, I don't use any special instrument other than the reverse Sinsky. And you like it to have that rounded tip to it. It doesn't have to be sharp like a chopper. All right, so that's removal. All right, and then this is the part that kind of has the most questions about it, right? This is the surgical steps. Um, the way I think about it is very simply that there's, there's, three, there's three parts. There's the injection of the graft. Uh, there's suturing the wound. And then there's the dance to get it in the right position and then unrolled and unfolded. And then you place the bubble underneath. Now, um, to inject it, there's different ways, right? There's the, the glass cannula to me is the most elegant and uh, um, I think it's the, the least traumatic to the tissue. Um, it can go through the smallest incision, but plenty of surgeons have good results using different kind of IOL injectors. Um, I used to use an IOL injector and once I was exposed to this through cornea gin here in the US, it uh, became my go-to injection. So the dance, consists of four, four and a half moves, okay? The first is to be able to flip the graft. So to flip the graft, you have to inject fluid underneath it to rotate it. You also have to learn to unroll it. That's done by shallowing the anterior chamber and tapping on the cornea. Then you have to confirm orientation. That's either done by getting an S stamp done preoperatively or using that uh, handheld slit lamp. Then once you have a bubble underneath it, you want to unfold it, and there's two types of folds we'll go into. And lastly, you, you have to center it. Now, different surgeons use different techniques. Some surgeons center the graft before they unroll it and unfold it, but to me, this, this, this technique that I have demonstrated can be done in any type of eye. It can be done with a deep chamber, a shallow chamber, um, whereas um, if you have to center it first, you really rely on the ability to collapse the anterior chamber in order to be able to unfold it. All right, so that's a flip. You just saw that right there. You, I went through my paracentesis, we'll show that again. And we've, I injected fluid underneath it and we flipped it. I'll show you one more time. 
through paracentesis, fluid underneath it, and you can see it flip. So that's a, that's a critical move. And what you're doing is you're just directing the current around the graft and catching it with it like a wave. All right, and then to unroll. So once you have it in the correct orientation, to unroll it, you have to shallow the chamber, and then you tap on the cornea to get it to unroll. Some people use two cannulas. Some people use uh, horizontal, or excuse me, perpendicular versus parallel taps. But the bottom line is that if the chamber is shallow, you're able to, uh, you're, you're able to unroll it. Now, this is another technique in which you release aqueous. We release aqueous in order to get it to come out. So uh, you saw here, I'll replay that video. Um, instead of tapping, what I do is I, I go through my main wound and I let fluid out. And that fluid draws that edge out. Then I tap it a little bit. I use that, I drip more fluid out, and then I have that perfect tricorn hat configuration. So the next step here is to confirm, and then we're able to go. Um, again, the confirmation steps. And then uh, here you may be able to tell, we shine the light on, and then you see two bands, one here and one here, instead of a one giant band. By seeing those two bands, you confirm that the, the graft is in the right orientation. One small band here, one small band here. Again, the two bands instead of the, the long single band. So on that last case, I had uh, three times I thought I had it in the right orientation, but it was upside down. All right, and uh, we talked about the orientation. All right, we're, they're bringing in the next patient now, but we still have some time to finish this. So then I place the 30 gauge can, uh, needle underneath the graft and inject about 0.4 cc's of air. And that allows me to then unfold the graft. Here I have an assistant to say they sometimes can push there if needed. Um, so then to, to unfold the graft, first you inject that small air bubble underneath it. And then you fill the AC with fluid a little bit. Here we're going. Again, just another video of going underneath it with a 30 gauge needle. You can use a cannula here, but the needle's smaller. All right. And then how to unfold it. So there's two types of folds. There's one called a point lock fold. You can see here where there's an edge to it and then an angle. And then there's one where it's a rolled fold and it's just one long flat thing here. So with the point lock fold, what you do is you tap right there and it will open up. With a rolled fold, you have to use the traction sutures and rotate the eye so that the bubble's going uphill, create space using the cannula in between the bubble and the fold, and then the bubble will come back and unfold it. The only situation in which I have to start over is if the graft gets stuck in the angle. So here's a rolled fold where you have that long, that, that long single, single fold. There's one right here. Um, so what I do is rotate the eye away, and then I put the cannula in between the bubble and the edge, and then it came back up. So I filled the AC a little bit right there. And then I pushed down here, causing the bubble to go posteriorly. And then its motion coming back creates a ripple that unfolds it. So now this graft is pretty much unfolded. And then what we would do is rotate the eye and center it and bring it to the uh, middle of the cornea. Here's another rolled fold. So again, you see that long flat edge here. Rotate the eye. Uh, all right, and then we're using the cannula here, and we're having the bubble come back up to the edge there. So, okay. Now, a point lock fold is a little bit different. We can still rotate the eye away, but instead of creating space there, you can simply tap it, and it'll open up like that. So a little bit easier. And then we use golf swings to center the graft. So we like to rotate the eye so that the graft goes downhill and you use smooth, broad strokes. You don't have to hit it as firmly as, as a D-sec. So there it's completely unfolded. We rotate the eye so the bubble's in the middle of the graft and then we're just gently nudging that little guy to the middle. And wait till we get it centered in our little dots and we're good. Okay. 
And then the last step uh, is we have an air bubble. We have the graph that's centered. And, um, and uh, we need to put a full air bubble there. So we go back with the 30 gauge needle, back through our incision. We try to join up with our original bubble and we, we fill up the eye like that. Now we know the graft is, is attached all the way around there. And if the eye is firm enough, we stop there. But if it's still soft, we would inject some air through the paracentesis. So here are all those moves together. So we got a good configuration, we think. No, we have to flip it. Okay, so now we're gonna unroll it a little bit by tap, by, oh, there we go. Still kind of making a dance around. We shallowed the AC there. And now we're gonna confirm to see if we have those in the correct orientation. Yeah, so we see two independent bands instead of one long band. I go under with a 30 gauge needle. Try not to distort the iris. Put that bubble there. All righty, so now we have the bubble. And now we're gonna fill the AC a little bit, makes that bubble smaller. There's an assistant here helping me. And now we got a good size bubble. Now we gotta get rid of these folds. That point lock fold, we just tap on the fold and it'll start to unfold on its own. And nice there, and same with that point lock fold. Now we couldn't get it just with that, so we're gonna rotate the eye, use, use gravity to help us. All right, so now we're, we're, we're basically unfolded and centered, and now we're gonna make the big air. So we go back, we join up the bubble, and this made a separate one. And now we have a full air bubble. If that's enough air, so how firm do you want it? You want it fairly firm, probably in the 30 to 40 millimeter range. If it's not firm enough, you can go in with a, uh, through a, a, new, a new incision using a 30 gauge needle. This is a technique I used to use, or you can go through the paracentesis, get the eye fairly firm, I'm, and we're done there. And then the patient lays flat in the post-op area for 45 minutes, and then we bring him back to the operating room, and then this is what we do down here. We go through a, a, new, a new stab wound, and we inject some fluid in order to create a meniscus. Uh, and we want to remove enough air to clear the inferior iridotomy that we had done previously. And the eye can be fairly soft at this point as long as there's a bubble in there that covers the whole diameter of the graft. Uh, so when I go back, we don't gown up completely, but we, we prep the patient again. I use sterile gloves. We inject BSS using a, uh, I use a 3cc syringe with a 30 gauge needle. If there's an epi defect from doing a superficial keratectomy, then we'll put a bandage lens in place. And then we patch and shield the patient just like anybody who's received a peribulbar block and we see them the next morning. I always call the patients the night of surgery. All right, so that's Alpamayo for any Peruvians there uh, in the audience. Um, and so this, is, this concludes the, um, the presentation part of it. Um, I'm gonna switch back to the, web, uh, to the FaceTime cam, and then I can answer any questions before starting with the second surgery. Um, so we'll go to FaceTime, okay. So we're good there. So what, you guys feel free to type in some questions. There's one here. Uh, Dr. Sujit Kumar says, can we use the S mark on the donor decimase for proper orientation? Yes, of course. Um, I think that uh, that makes life easier. Um, the thing is that any preparation that's done um, in the eye bank prior to the surgery does run the risk of killing endothelial cells. And since I'm so used to using the microscope uh, as well as the, the handheld slit lamp, I kind of just feel it's an extra step in graft preparation that I don't need. But if you're preparing, yeah, by all means do it. What you can do is fold the graft over using viscoelastic and then gently touch the posterior stromus, the, the stromal side of it with the S mark and be able to mark it. Um, I've watched live surgery, for example, at Caracon last year with doctors Basak and Fogla and they did it and they can prepare the graft in like 10, 15 minutes uh, during the surgery. So uh, in the US it's evolved where we receive the tissue already pre-stained, pre-marked, uh, and pre-stamped if you want. Um, and that takes a lot of the, the time. Um, so there's a question here from uh, uh, Dr. Moreno. It uh, says, uh, any experience on DWEC, similar results, question mark? So DWEC would be decimate stripping without endothelial keratoplasty. Um, this would be patient, the ideal patient for this would be somebody who has only central gutte and not extending, no pseudophagic bullus or anything like that just where the central part of the cornea has guttata. And what you do is you, you peel it instead of uh, using the, the uh, reverse Sinsky hook and scraping it, you kind of do a reverse desmetorexis. Um, 
and it can take months to clear, but very, but they have good results when combined with the rock inhibitors. So I think that's a reasonable thing. Um, I think that's a reasonable thing to do if you have the right patient and they have the right mindset that they don't mind, you know, waiting or maybe uh, okay to undergo DMEC. In the U.S., we have some patients that cannot receive tissue because of their religious beliefs, and I think it would be an ideal situation uh, for somebody like that. Um, another question by Dr. Ja. Um, he asks, have you tried Sarnac Cola's cannula to, cannula to unfold the donor lenticule? Uh, I believe this is the cannula that has ports on the side that spray it so that it opens like that. And I'm sure we have some video, we could find some videos that look really great. Um, I think it, what you need to do is find a technique that you're comfortable with and kind of master it. Um, Dr. Sarnacola, of course, is an excellent surgeon and with his cannula, I'm sure he's great. I feel like I don't need to I don't need to insert a cannula inside the graft to, to blow it open. I can do it with external movements. Um, uh, and so I, have not, I haven't tried that. But again, this is what the wet lab's for. You try these different things and you find out what, what works for you. Um, let's see, no open questions at this time. We're pretty much, uh, we're pretty much ready here. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go get ready to get the patient prepped and start the second surgery, okay? Um, Okay, one more question. Dr. Sadu asked, what is the appropriate size of a DMEG graft? So in a corneal diameter of 12 millimeters, it would be eight millimeters. In a corneal diameter that's smaller, anywhere from seven to eight. Um, I find that, uh, if that if the chamber is shallow, you must choose a small graft because you're not gonna be able to unfold it if you use an eight millimeter one. So I measure all my patients preoperatively with white to white, and I use that to, um, I use that to determine graft size. But I've had a case that I couldn't get it to unfold because I chose too, too large of a, of a size. And so what you have to do is you tell the eye bank ahead of time what size, what size, graft, what size graft you want. Um, very good, so I'll get ready. Okay, so we got Patient cornet, we're doing left eye, fuchs dystrophy, right cornea, all good? Yes, sir. All right, so we just did a timeout confirming patient's name and side. Okay, Mr. Cornet, this is Dr. Lehman, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Mr. Cornett's age. What's his age? No, no, the patient. 77. Okay. All right, guys. So this is a 77 year old male. Same thing with a history of fuchs corneal dystrophy. And uh, he's had cataract surgery and we're just doing the DMAC part here. Hi, Mr. Cornett. It's Dr. Layman. I'm sorry. You're gonna hear me talking. We're doing that little webinar. Like I talked about. Yeah. Can you put the bed down a little bit and then rotate the feet down? Now feetsies. Yeah, okay. Put your chin down a little bit, sir. There you go, perfect, okay. All right, folks, so now we're bringing the scope in here. Oh, we, we, gave, we just gave you some, we'll give you a little bit more. And uh, so everybody in the audience, you guys can see it looks okay, yeah. Um, and so we get started. And same steps that we did in the previous surgery where we used the traction sutures first. Um, and if you like to take uh, the procedure takes the less time than it does to spend the fighting out. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. These are kind of funny needle drivers. Okay. So, just doing the same thing we did last time. Pass those sutures, and then we're going to tie these off. Mr. Cornett, I'm gonna be talking to the audience here that's watching the webinar. You, if you could just try, to, just try to be quiet. If you have a problem, you can of course let me know. But uh, if you answer my question, okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. All right, so passing the other traction suture, cutting the needle, handing it back to my assistant, and then tying a knot on this. So, same thing here. And then next step, of course, is to mark the cornea. Get that guy centered for y'all. Move any extra BSS. Can I have point one two? Yeah, or or anything to that. Yeah, I'm just gonna center that a little better. There we go. So you can see the pupils displaced a little bit because of the pilo. We're gonna just go for the cent geometric center of the cornea. Looks nice and centered there. He has a big cornea, as you can see. That's eight millimeters, and there's plenty of room. Plenty of room for my paras where I won't hit the. I won't hit the tunnel uh, or the tunnel won't go into the potential interface. And now the next steps, of course, are our pairs and TCs. So we're going to make our main incision here. So we like them 45 degrees to either side, anterior enough to avoid conge. and kind of in the plane of the iris, but not so long as to go into our interface. Uh, this is that viscoelastic. You can put some BSS on the cornea for me. And then main wound. So we've just fixated the globe with the... Okay, so I go right at the limbus right here. Shallower than I would a, a, a phaco wound, not as long the tunnel. And then we're going to use the reverse Sinsky. Adjust the speculum a little bit so that fluid doesn't accumulate. Okay, and so now we're going to remove decimase. Same step. I'm going to put a little more viscoelastic. You can see how the iris kind of popped forward right there. There we go. And so again, a lot of docs do this under air, and that's perfectly fine, especially if where you live, viscoelastic is kind of prohibitively expensive, but I feel like it, you can use the main wound. It's kind of easier to, it's kind of easier and more stable to do it with viscoelastic. Um, but uh, you can do it under air, and you can even inject air if you have areas that you don't, you aren't sure that the the donor was removed or the recipient was removed, you can put in some air underneath the viscoelastic and it'll stay in the eye and kind of show you stuff. Okay, some tires. And now I remove it. Can I give it for a donor? That's the last bit in visco uh, INA. So now we use INA handpiece to remove the viscoelastic. Let's see, a real tight fit because I made like a 2 4 incision. All right. All right. So now I'm going to use BSS, please. I just want to kind of confirm that all the viscoelastic is out. So the way I can do that is to inject a little BSS and see if I can deepen it, see if anything's floating around. I don't see anything. I'll try to shallow the chamber. It's about as shallow as it gets, and then I'm gonna just fill it right now before I go turn my attention to the donor. So I'll take the donor cornea. You can turn the room lights on for this part. Okay. All right, so now off camera, I'm just pulling that little sled into our Petri dish. I use forceps for that. Okay, so let's see what we got. We can see the, you can see the, the sled, you can see the glass cannula with viscoelastic, and you can see that the, the, don the donor is kind of stuck up on this end. So I'm gonna go ahead and take out the, plast the cannula out of the sled. 
And then we want this little guy to go downhill a little bit. So I'm gonna kind of get it away from there. So I'm gonna lift it up. And then I'm gonna use a little bit of fluid like this to kind of get it to go downhill. So you can see it starts to fall a little bit in the cannula, the glass cannula. So just getting it away from that top because I don't want to take this off and by accident pull the, so now I can attach this. And just with like little bursts, I can kind of gently nudge it down into the cannula. And at the same time, I'm getting out the, getting out the leptosol. Just little nudges like that. All right, can I, uh, I have to put more BSS in my 3cc syringe. I'll just use this, I got it. Okay. All right, where do we wanna get it? We wanna get it just to the neck right there. Beautiful, okay. So I give this to my assistant. And we're good. We've got the donor in the right position. And then we'll turn our attention to the patient and get the room lights. And then we'll just zoom in and focus. Okay. So let me see a little BSS first. And what am I doing here is I'm just going to fill the AC so it doesn't collapse. Okay. And I'm going to bring our little guy in. And then have a cannula on standby for me. Okay, so we got our little guy bevel up here. Okay. Okay, now, see that cannula? Here's a true a cannula, please. Just, just a, and so what I'm gonna do, if I withdraw this, there's a chance that this guy could come with me. So what I wanna do is, I wanna rotate him perpendicular to my incision, or at least at least away from it a little bit. There we go. So now he can't come out. Now I'm gonna suture my wound. And you notice I kept the cannula in the wound. If I take it out f too fast, I run the risk of, I run the risk of ex uh, expulsion of the, of the donor. All right. Tires. Zoom out for this. Okay. One, two, three. And not too tight. So that may be a little too tight. That's pretty good because we're going to fill the chamber. Of course, I'm tying a soft eye. And so whatever I do now is going to have more effect. Scissors, please. Then when it's full, okay, and then rotate that knot, okay, take that 10 cc syringe, and now we begin to dance. So again, the first step is to kind of flip it and unroll it. All right, so now starting to unroll a little better, easier than the first one. There we go, we got that shape we like. So I'm letting fluid out, but that folded too much. So I'm gonna come over here. Okay, that's what we want right there. So you see these two rolls like that? Can I see the camera? And I confirmed that there's two rolls there instead of a big broad one. Okay, so small air. Now it's not in the ideal position, uh, it's a little off to the side, but it's okay. I can flatten the chamber a little bit. And, and then I can try to unfold it a little more and that's gonna give me more leverage. Okay. My 30 gauge, and this is kind of the closest point to enter to go do it. So this is where I wanna go in. Can you wanna use nice cannulas for this that don't, uh, I mean, nice uh, syringes that have good action. You don't wanna go in and then end up putting in a huge bubble. I'm trying to wiggle in that incision the same way that I, 
There we go, I'm in. I'm avoiding the iris, I'm underneath it. And then, okay, so I got a couple of bubbles, but I can live with that. Um, now we have to fill the AC a little bit. That's, so the, the bigger it is, the more we can kind of manipulate. So we kind of have two bubbles just for, just for fun. I'll go ahead and go ahead and take this little one out. Okay, now, so we have a bubble, we have a graft with a point lock fold and a rolled fold. So the point lock fold is easier. So what do we have to do? I'm gonna rotate the eye this way. And then we're gonna use the bubble to unstick the fold by tapping on the fold. So we got that unfolded, okay? Now we got this one. That's easy, you just tap it. Now it's off center. So we gotta rotate the eye, keeping the bubble underneath the graft. And then these gentle movements like this to move it centrally keeping the eye where the graft is going down the hill and the, the bubble staying in the middle of the graft. Sorry for the other one getting in the way. I think we're pretty well centered now. Uh, it would probably be to me a little bit, so I'm just gonna move it like that. So now we have the graft and now we're gonna use the same cannula and, so, excuse me, the same syringe and the same needle and we're gonna wiggle our way into that wound again. Go underneath the graft, join with the original bubble. Oh, I didn't join it, okay. And now we have a, an air bubble. So now we're gonna test the, test the cornea here. It's still pretty soft. So I'm gonna inject air by just going in my para, just a smidge. All right, so still, still kind of soft. Okay, let me try a little more. Not quite the tense. There you go, that's what I like. Okay, so we're good. Now I take the scissors, move this, and then here, and then we're all good. And we let the patient stay for 45 minutes. So again, thank you very much. And uh, we'll take some questions, thank you. All right, so everything went great. Um, and we won't probably be televising the we won't be televising the rebubble stuff, guys. So, so you guys are good. Thank you. And I'll just take some questions and close up the webinar. Um, Okay, so um, that surgery went uh, a little smoother in the fact that the graft was not as scrolly and I was able to uh, get in the correct orientation on the first try. So the, the normal case is somewhere in the middle of those two. But uh, that's all I have uh, today. So uh, if there are no questions, I would uh, appreciate say just thank you for your attention and um, I, my my uh, email address I can send and anybody can send me questions. I'll, I'll send it here in the, uh, in the chat um, to everybody, to all panelists and attendees. This is my email address, layman at focalpointvision.com. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, here's one. Okay, how can visibility be improved if there's stromal edema, asks Patrick Item. Um, thankfully, you can do DMAC through a pretty terrible cornea. Just remove the epithelium and you can pretty much see anything. Using that handheld slit lamp or a pipe, light pipe will give you a better view of the anterior chamber if needed. But uh, what you could do is remove the epithelium and then uh, you could um, improve the view that way. You could also leave the epithelium, use uh, saline drops, hyperosmotic drops, that can sometimes help as well. Um, but most of the time, it's very rare that there's a cornea that we can't, uh, that we can't see through. Um, Dr. Ja asked, any tips to manage unfolding better in a pigmented iris? So the things that make unfolding difficult are uh, posterior, uh, peripheral anterior synechiae, um, vit vitreous, and any kind of fibrin in the AC. So what you would do is, if you have a pigmented iris with a bad view, after you do the first steps of the surgery, you would uh, do the, uh, use a vitrector with viscoelastic in the anterior chamber and make an inferior ototomy. And then you place an air bubble for the 10 to 20 minutes it takes to prep the graft. 
that air bubble will keep any fibrin or blood from, uh, from spreading all over the anterior chamber. It'll get it to coagulate and you'd be good. I mean, a pigmented iris alone isn't any more difficult than a, than a blue iris to, to do DMEC on. But if it's a pigmented iris that has pseudophagic bullets and has bad things because of that, it may not be able to do DMEC and you have to do a DSEC on that. Again, if the chamber is very shallow, you have to use a small area of graft. You got to be able to hold a bubble. So if the iris is messed up and you can't hold a bubble, that's going to be a problem. But uh, iris color alone is not uh, either way uh, a contraindication. Okay, I got to thank you from one of the attendees. Thank you all. Um, all right, I guess I'm going to sign on out. I, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Bye from San Antonio.